To the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, greetings. My name is Nazari, and I follow the teachings of the Disciples of Truth. Today, I'm going to be doing a lesson, and the title of it is called, The Messiah Came from Seed. So we're going to be using the King James Version of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, to prove that he had an earthly father. Now, when we think about this doctrine, this Immaculate Conception Doctrine, and we say that the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary. If you already looked at the video that I did about the Holy Spirit being a female, then you would understand that that's not possible because two women do not bring forth a child. Okay? So if you haven't seen that video, you can go and take a look at it. Another point is that if the Holy Spirit is the one that impregnated Mary, and we already understand that the Spirit is separate from the Father, then the child does not belong to the Father. The child actually belongs to the Holy Spirit. The whole doctrine of Immaculate Conception is just confusion. Okay? So we're going to go to the opening scripture, which is Psalms 132, verse 11. And it says, The highest had sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. So he says, of the fruit of David's body, he's going to put someone on the throne. Okay, so where is immaculate conception in that? 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 12, it says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. So this is talking about the Messiah, right? He said, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. Let's see if that really happened. When we look at Acts chapter 13, verse 22 to 23, it reads, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave their testimony, and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed had the Most High, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior. So again, all the scriptures say it came from seed. We see bowels, we see seed. Okay? Of this man's seed, I'm going to read 23 again. Of this man's seed had the Most High, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior. Of David's seed. It goes back to what we just read in the earlier chapters and verses. The next scripture we're going to look at is Acts chapter 2, verse 29 to 30. It says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that the highest had sworn with an oath unto him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne. Now, this is very graphic and detailed. It's nothing hidden or covert about what this scripture is saying. It tells you that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne. So where is the Immaculate Conception in these scriptures? All of the prophecies, all of the scriptures confirm that the Messiah had to come from seed. We're going to continue to prove that point. Romans chapter 1 verse 3, it says, Concerning his son, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now there's no interpretation here. It says what it says according to the flesh. Now, I know some people might be thinking, well, okay, Mary would have been the seed of David, but where in the scripture can you find this doctrine? When we look at the lineage from Matthew chapter 1, right, in the beginning, it comes down and it shows you that Joseph, the father of the Messiah, is in the lineage of David. We don't see any lineage with Mary being in, in there from the seed of David. And furthermore, a woman, she can gather seed and carry it, but she doesn't originally have seed. The seed that she has is implanted in her from the man. 
So when it says the seed, there's no way it could be in relations to a woman because the lineage was always traced through the male. It's the same thing when we talk about the Messiah. Another point I'm going to ask is, why is it that in the scriptures, the Messiah is referred to as the Son of Man? He said he called himself the Son of Man. It's right there in the Bible. So how can he be the Son of Man if he doesn't have a man for his father, an earthly, fleshly human being? We're going to read it. Matthew chapter 9 verse 6, it says, But that ye may know that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the sick of the palm sea, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. Matthew chapter 18 verse 11, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. He refers to himself as the Son of Man. Everyone in the scriptures knew him as the Son of Man. Now we're going to prove that this son of man can't be something outside of what it's talking about. Numbers chapter 23 verse 19. It says, The highest is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Okay? So this even diffuses the so-called trinity. Because it tells you right here that the most high is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. That's Numbers 23 verse 19. So we know based off of these scriptures, when we go down in the New Testament and it says the son of man, the son of man, he had to have come from seed, as the scripture rightfully says. Now, some people say, well, they refer to him as the son of God. So let's find out what this son of God is talking about when it uses that in its context. We're going to look at John chapter 1 verse 12. It says, but as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So the scripture is telling you that if you believe, you have the power to become the son of God. And we know that the Messiah, of course, he believed in the Father because he was sent of the Father. And this video is not to discredit his power, his authority in any way. But it's for us to come out of this whole deception, this whole doctrine that is false. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to tell me that the Most High took a woman on earth and had a child with her, first of all, he's breaking his own commandments because he said, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Mary and Joseph were, were already married. They were already espoused. So how would he covet a next man's wife? And have a child with her. That's confusion and corruption. And it's false. He would never take another man's wife and, and get a child with her. It's not possible. He goes against his own order. That's point blank and simple. Now let's look at John chapter 1 verse 45. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. The Messiah of Nazareth, the son of of Joseph the son of Joseph so everybody in the scripture already knew that Joseph was the biological father of the Messiah and if you're gonna say that this means adopted or whatever I've heard the arguments nowhere in the scripture does it says that this was an adopted son that's not biblical because for them to be going around the town and telling people that this is my child this is my child and that's not the case then they're just lying they're telling lies. And that's not what happened. Now we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Goes back to this seed again. Wherefore in all things it behooven him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to the Almighty, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Okay, we read verse 17. Wherefore in all things it behooven him to be made like unto his brethren. It doesn't say in some things. How were his brethren made? Mother and father. It says, verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. This is what the scripture is telling us. So we need to come out of these doctrines and false beliefs. We're going to look now at Luke chapter 1 verse 31. Here's what the prophecies say. And behold, 
thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and they shall call his name and they have the J-E-S-U-S -S in there but we know that's not his name I'm gonna do a lesson on that as well okay but it says and behold thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son so this is what Mary is going to do she's going to conceive in her womb how do you conceive comes from seed we're gonna prove that Luke chapter 1 verse 36 it says and behold thy cousin Elizabeth she had also conceived a son in her old age so if you're telling me right that the Messiah is an immaculate conception of invisible birth or whatever you want to term it but the same exact words that they use for Elizabeth they use for Mary in the scriptures it says ye shall conceive so if you're going to tell me the Messiah was an immaculate conception, then you're going to have to admit that John the Baptist, based on your reasoning, is also an immaculate conception. Because the angel went to both of them and told them the same thing. I'm going to read it again. Luke chapter 1 verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Okay? Luke chapter 1 verse 36. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth she had also conceived so she had also she has already done the same thing that is happening to you she had also conceived a son in her old age this is what the scriptures say now we're going to take a look at first samuel chapter 2 verse 21 to continue with the whole conceiving to show you what that really means in the scriptures and the highest visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. She conceived. So if you're going to tell me that one is an immaculate conception, then all of these scriptures in the Bible when it says that she shall conceive, that has to be an immaculate conception as well. But that's not the case. Now we're going to look at Judges chapter 13 verse 6 to 7. It says... Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of the Almighty came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told he me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Okay? Thou shalt conceive and bear a son. So the angel visited all of these different people and told them the exact same thing that was told to Mary. Thou shalt conceive. It means what it means. Now we're, we're going to take a look at Hebrews 11 and 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. What do you conceive? Seed. Where does seed come from? The man. Okay, so the Messiah had to have an earthly father. First John chapter 5 verse 6. It says, This is he that came by water and blood, even the Messiah, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bear it witness, because the Spirit is truth. So it's telling you that he came from water, which is the mother's womb, Okay, that's what the water there is talking about. And blood, which is from the Father. When a man gets aroused, what happens? Blood. There's a rush of blood. This is what the scripture is showing us. He didn't just come from water alone. He also came from blood. First John 5 and 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even the Messiah, not by water only, but by water and by blood. It says what it says. All the scriptures, we could go over many more. But I think that's fair enough. If you can't see it, then you just don't want to see it. Now, let's look at some of the points that other persons use to say that it was an immaculate conception. The first thing you have to understand is, based on the Bible, what is a virgin? According to scripture, and we're going to prove it, a virgin just means a young woman of maritable age. It has nothing to do with someone who's never known a man because you could know a man and still be considered a, a virgin based on the scripture. Someone who is pure or never been touched would be considered as a maid in the scripture and we're going to read the scriptures and prove it. Genesis chapter 24 verse 16. Remember now we're going to break down what a virgin is. 
and the damsel was very fair to look upon. A virgin, neither had any man known her. So if a virgin means someone that's never had intercourse, there will be no need for this scripture to show a difference and say, neither had any man known her. I'm going to read it again. Genesis chapter 24, verse 16. And the damsel was very fair to look upon. A virgin, neither had any man known her. It's two separate things. Judges chapter 21, verse 12. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gelid, 400 young virgins that had known no man by lying with them. Okay, so it's showing you they found 400 young virgins that had known no man in addition. So it's two separate things. The next chapter and verse we're going to look at is Lamentations chapter 1 verse 18. It says, The highest is righteous, for I have rebelled against his commandments. Hear, I pray you, all people, and behold my sorrow, my virgins and my young men are gone into captivity. Okay, so it says, my virgins and the young men. So the women and men have gone into captivity. Joel chapter 1 verse 8. Lament like a virgin girdle with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Now, if a virgin means someone that has never known a man, then there's no way that she could be married, like this scripture is saying. Lament like a virgin girdle with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. So this virgin was married. Another point that people try to use, they say, well, if Joseph and Mary had intercourse, then they had premarital affair or premarital sex or whatever they want to call it. But there is no scripture in the Bible that perpetuates this concept of premarital sex. Because based on scriptures, once you lie with someone, that's how the two become one flesh. That is the initiation of the marriage. That's not a sin. Two people having intercourse is not a sin. Unless you're married already and you go and sleep with somebody else, then you're committing adultery. So we know that Joseph and Mary, they were not married to anybody, right? So when they came together and had intercourse, it would not be considered premarital sex, as he's been led to believe. We're going to prove that. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 28 to 29. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found. Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he had humbled her. He may not put her away all the days of his life. There's nothing here about premarital sex. It's showing you the order of marriage. Exodus chapter 22 verse 16. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed, and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. So it's not a sin to go and have intercourse with someone if you're in a relationship with that person. It's the act of marriage. It's the initiating act of marriage. We're going to continue to prove that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 36. But if any man think that he behave himself uncomely towards his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and needs so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not. Let them marry. Let's read it again. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 36. But if any man think that he behave himself uncomely towards his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and needs so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not. It is written. Now we're going to look at some direct scriptures that people try to use to say that it had to be an immaculate conception. And we're going to debunk them. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. We're going to read to 17. It says, Therefore the highest himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So we already went over what a virgin conceiving means. It means a woman is going to have a child. There's no immaculate conception in this scripture. And furthermore, we're going to prove that this particular scripture in Isaiah chapter 7 is not talking about the Messiah himself directly. It's talking about Isaiah's son. Let's continue to read. 
Verse 15, Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. The highest shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come. For the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. Now we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1 to 4. Moreover, so he's continuing the story here. It says, Moreover, the highest said unto me, Take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning Mahershal al Hashbaz. Verse 2 And I took unto me faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberekiah. And I went unto the prophetess. And she conceived and bare a son. Okay. Then says the highest to me, call his name Meher Shalal Hashbaz. So right here it's telling you who Isaiah chapter 7 is talking about. And I went unto the prophetess and she conceived. So this is what the scripture is talking about. When you read the whole thing in its context, then you'd understand that it's not talking directly about the Messiah, but it is a prophecy to his coming. Because it's just like in the scriptures when we have, for example, Abraham, when he was told to go and sacrifice his son. It's the same thing that happened now in the New Testament when the, when the father himself sacrificed his son. So it is a prophetic something. Or when we look at the story with Joseph, right? When he was in Egypt and he went down, he was held in the prison and he told one of the men that, the, one of the two men that were with him, he told one that you're going to be exalted and you're going to sit next to the king again. And the other one, he told him you're going to be put to death. So when the Messiah was hanging on the, on the tree, it's the same thing that happened. One of the men did not make it, right, into righteousness sake. But the other man, he told him that I said to you that you would be in paradise. So we have to understand that there's a lot of prophetic things that happen in the Old Testament that lead up to the New Testament. Next scripture we're going to look at now that people use to say, well, it has to be an invisible birth is Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 to 20. It says, Now the birth of the Messiah was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to keep reading and then I'm going to go over it. Verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Verse 20, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the highest appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so now we're just going to go over the verses. Nowhere in this scripture does Joseph say, this is not my child. It gives you the reason why it says he wanted to put her away. It says because he didn't want to make her a public example. It says nothing about the child wasn't mine. So we can't just go and assume that that's what he's talking about. Let's go into the scriptures and find out exactly what's taking place. It says, Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. Now the birth of the Messiah was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together. So this came together has nothing to do with intercourse. You're going to have to show me in the scripture where it says coming together means intercourse. That's not what it means. The coming together is talking about the ceremony. The gathering together for the marriage. So before they came together to this ceremony, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. So we know that the Messiah was of the Holy Spirit. He was anointed. Right? We're going to show you now in Luke chapter 22 verse 66. It says, And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together. So they came together, they gathered together. So this is what it's talking about in Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. Now we look at Luke chapter 22 verse 48. It says, And all the people that came together to that site, behold, the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. You see, the people that came together, it's not talking about intercourse in that scripture. It's saying before they went to the ceremony, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. So she was already pregnant before the ceremony. 
And the custom of a, a wedding ceremony in the scripture is you would go into a tent, you would lay with the woman, she would bleed, and then you would show them a cloth with the blood on it from her, showing that this woman was a maiden, that she was pure. And if you can't produce that cloth, then she's going to be stoned to death. So Joseph already knew that he lied with her. So there's no way that they could produce this cloth. So this is what they were talking about when he said he was minded to put her away privately. Now we're going to look at Luke chapter 4 verse 1. And the Messiah being full of the Spirit returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So we already established the point that he was full of the Spirit. So when it says she was found with child of the Holy Spirit, he was full of the Spirit. This child was anointed. Right Now we're going to look at Romans chapter 7 verse 12. It says, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandments holy and just and good. So he was full of the commandments. Because it talks about him being holy. Right? He was full of the Spirit. He knew the law. Now we're going to prove the marriage ceremony and the customs as to why he wanted to put her away privately. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 13 to 17. If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasion of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. So he found her to not be pure. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hated her. And lo, he had given occasion of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. And yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. So it's saying now, it's giving you a breakdown of how the ceremony went. The whole clot to produce the clot that I was speaking about earlier. We have the scripture right here. Right? So it's not a fabricated concept. It's in the scriptures. Right? So he can't he say to the elders, this woman was not a maid, she was unpure. Right? So he's trying to instigate to get a stone because it says he went into her, unto her, and he didn't like her. He hated her. So it's telling you that you have to produce the clot of the damsel's virginity. So just when we just when we go over the scripture in what happened in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 20. We get the understanding now that it says nothing about this child is not mine. You had an affair. Joseph doesn't make any claims like this. It, the only reason it gives you that he wanted to put her away, it says he didn't want to make her a public example. And this public example is at the wedding ceremony. You go into the tent, you come out, you're supposed to produce this clot. If you can't produce the clot, you're stoned to death. That is the only reason or explanation that Joseph gave. Okay? We just read the scriptures, so all the information is there. Another verse that persons try to use is Luke chapter 1, verse 31 to 36. It says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. So this very verse contradicts what they're saying, right? Because verse 32, it says, He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the highest shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Okay, so this is the verse that people like to use to say, that. Well, Mary tells you, you know, she doesn't know how she's going to get a child or what have you. It says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of the Almighty. So let's go over these scriptures, right? Now, the one point that they love to use is say, See, right there it says, The Holy Spirit is going to come upon her. But it, this coming upon you doesn't have anything to do with getting pregnant. Let's prove it. Judges chapter 3 verse 10. It says, And the Spirit of the Highest came upon him, and he judged Israel, and went out to war. Okay? The Spirit of the Highest came upon him. So did this person get pregnant? No, they didn't. 1 Samuel chapter 11 verse 6. And the Spirit of the Highest came upon Saul, 
when he heard those tidings and his anger was kindled greatly. Now, did he get pregnant? No, but it's using the same terminology. The Spirit came upon Saul. So when we go back to the story and it says that the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, then we understand that that does not mean I'm going to impregnate you. Because the Spirit came upon many of the prophets in the scripture. It's just telling you that you're under the anointing. So if you're under the anointing, anything that comes out of you is of the Spirit. So he was indeed born of the Spirit. Because the Spirit was overshadowing Mary. We're going to look at the verse a little more in detail again. It says, this is the part, verse 34. It says, Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now, for anyone to believe that this scripture has anything to do with Mary saying, how am I going to conceive a child and I don't have a man, that would make no sense. Because then you're telling me that Mary is asking, where do babies come from? And it already tells you early up in the verses that she was espoused to Joseph. Okay? So, what she's really asking is, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? So, she's saying, I don't know a man with such power and authority. I don't know. I know not a man. This is old English. This is the way that people spoke. I know not a man. We're going to prove it, right? Let's read it and get the understanding. It says in verse 32, He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the highest shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Verse 33, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So this here is the miracle that Mary is concerned about. She's saying, how can this be, seeing I know not a man? I don't know a man with such authority and such power. How is this going to happen? So he, the angel responds to her. He says, and the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. So the power is overshadowing her. Therefore, so because the Spirit is upon you, therefore, because... Also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. It doesn't say that the Holy Spirit is going to impregnate you. Right? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit is going to put a seed inside of you. That, I mean, that's ridiculous. It's heretic. Alright? Now, we're going to look at Luke chapter 1 verse 24. We're going to go a little earlier up in the story. Right? It says... And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus had the highest dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me, to take away my reproach among men. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from the Most High unto a city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Okay? So when we go further up again, we already know that Mary was espoused. So why in the world would Mary be asking, how am I going to get pregnant? Why? Mary doesn't know where babies come from. It doesn't add up. That theory does not add up. Let's continue reading. It says in 28, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the highest is with thee. Blessed art thee among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at this saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with the Almighty. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Again, conceive. So now we have all the evidence, you know, the both sides of the argument as to this immaculate conception or this deception or whatever you want to call it. It's completely false. The point still stands. He's not going to take another man's wife and get a child with her. That is how you convert your neighbor's wife. One of the commandments we are commanded not to do. So why would the Almighty turn around and break his own laws and his own statutes? Makes no sense. The Holy Spirit is a female, so a female cannot impregnate Mary. If you're not aware of these things, then you could look at some of my other videos where I break this down about the Holy Spirit being a female. Also the video that debunks the Trinity.
okay? Because we know that if the spirit is separate from the father and it's the spirit that impregnated anyone, then therefore the, the child does not belong to the father. You see, the whole thing is just confusion. It's corrupt. It's not biblical. So in conclusion, all the evidence is there. We know that the Messiah came from seed, from the seed of Joseph, from the seed of David, from the seed of Abraham. If you can't see it, then you just don't want to see it. Let us close with this scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter. Fear the Most High and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of man. Selah.